War Powers Resolution. Lawmakers debate whether to limit President Donald Trump's ability to launch military attacks against Iran. We have team coverage. Persecuted Christians. We hear how the tension between the United States and Tehran is affecting the faithful in Iraq. Fight for the unborn. A Democrat lawmaker tells us why he's speaking at the Chicago March for Life this weekend. And a message from the Pope. What the Holy Father told diplomats who work with the Vatican. On EWTN News Nightly for Thursday, January 9th, 2020. Thanks for joining us tonight. I'm Tracy Sable. With congressional opposition from the Democrats, the president is defending his order to kill an Iranian general. The Trump administration briefed lawmakers on why the president carried out the strike, but even some Republicans are questioning the president's decision. White House correspondent Mark Irons reports. Mark? Tracy, the president spent another day defending his action to take out Iran's top general, Qasem Soleimani. And despite criticism from two Republican senators, the president says he made the right call. We caught a total monster. The U.S. drone strike that killed Iran General Qasem Soleimani caused Iran to respond with a missile strike aimed at U.S. troops in Iraq. But the president says he was justified in making the initial call to kill Soleimani. We did it because they were looking to blow up our embassy. We also did it for other reasons that were very obvious. Somebody died. One of our military people died. People were badly wounded just a week before. The president's national security team briefed lawmakers yesterday on why the strike was carried out. But Democrats found the intelligence insufficient and the decision to strike reckless, with the potential to spark war. Republican Senators Rand Paul and Mike Lee say the briefing didn't provide enough answers. Which I would add was probably the worst briefing I've seen, at least on a military issue, in the nine years I've served in the United States Senate. Lee and Paul say lawmakers' voices were stifled in deciding if the strike should be carried out, and the president overstepped his authority. The president says he had to make a quick decision about Soleimani and claims lawmakers applauded him for providing Congress with the reasons for the strike. I had calls from numerous senators and numerous congressmen and women saying it was the greatest presentation they've ever had. Republicans have largely supported the president's action, saying he was well within his power to take out General Soleimani, who was heading operations against Americans in the Middle East. The U.S. considered Soleimani a terrorist. Tracy. All right. White House correspondent Mark Irons. Thank you, Mark. Well, the White House gears, the House gears up for a vote to limit President Trump's military action against Iran. It comes as Democratic criticism intensifies over the U.S. killing of the top Iranian general. The Democratic bill is expected to pass over solid Republican opposition. Catholic News Agency's Matt Hadro reports now from Capitol Hill. Congress has allowed its war powers to erode since the passage of the Authorization of Use for Military Force in 2001. That was passed to fight terrorism after the 9-11 attacks. There was a second AUMF for the invasion of Iraq in 2002. Speaker Pelosi's non-binding resolution calls on President Trump to terminate military hostilities in or against Iran. Pray for peace. We must avoid war. Speaker Pelosi accuses the president of conducting a provocative airstrike against Iran that endangered Americans and of doing it without consulting Congress. Pelosi says that's why this war powers resolution is needed. We're taking this path because it does not require a statement by the uh, a signature of the president of the United States. This is a statement of the Congress of the United States, and I will not have that statement be diminished by whether the president will veto it or not. She's striving to restrain the president, even as she concedes the Iranian general was guilty of bad actions. We have no illusions about Iran, no illusions about Soleimani. He was a terrible person, did bad things. But it's not about how bad they are. It's about how good we are. And Leader McCarthy accuses the speaker of going soft on Soleimani. Anytime I hear a Democrat talk about him and say he was bad, but then use the word but, yes, I question it. There is no but when it comes to Soleimani. He was bad because, not but. And Republican Debbie Lesko argues the resolution is not what it claims to be. Terminate the use of United States armed forces to engage in hostilities in or against Iran. Doesn't say about future war. 
We do not currently have U.S. armed forces engaged in hostilities in or against Iran. Yesterday, the president of the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops issued a statement calling on all parties to, quote, embrace peace rather than violence. At the Capitol, Matt Hadro, EWTN News Nightly. Joining me now from Capitol Hill is Representative Dan Lipinski, Democrat from Illinois. Congressman, welcome back. Thanks so much for joining us. Good to be with you. Well, I'd like to start off today with yesterday's classified briefing on Iran. You released a statement saying, quote, there are still questions about how America moves forward with a strategic plan with respect to Iran and how America will respond to Iranian aggression in the future. Congress must have input addressing these questions. What exactly does input entail for you? Well, first of all, I want to have a better idea of what the administration's plan is. Uh, are there plans for more action in uh, Iran or, or against Iran? Look, the uh, killing of Soleimani uh, was a risk, but it appears so far that it has, has paid off, which is, which is very good. Uh, but you know, I, I don't want to wind up getting involved in a situation like Libya. I voted against uh, President Obama's intervention in, in Libya. Uh, that wound up being a disaster. I'm hopeful that uh, right now there are no future plans for anything like that when it comes to Iran, but I want to hear that from the administration. All right, I want to switch gears right now. Uh, you've signed on to a friend of the court brief filed in Louisiana case before the Supreme Court seeking to overturn Roe versus Wade. Why was that important for you to do that? Well, I think you know, this law in Louisiana, which was written by a African-American uh, Democratic female representative, as, as Katrina Jackson said, uh, this is about protecting women. And women who are going to have an abortion should have the same uh, protections as anyone going in for elective surgery at a surgery center in Louisiana. Uh, I think it's just common sense. And so I'm hopeful that the Supreme Court is going to uphold the Louisiana law when they hear the case in March. And we know that you're speaking this weekend at the March for Life rally in Chicago. What's going to be your message? Well, my message is pro-life is pro-women. Uh, so often uh, we get attacked uh, for being anti-woman, but truly caring for women is being pro-life. There are better choices, better options for women, uh, and I think we need to make that very clear. I mean, I, I have, uh, especially with this amicus brief being the latest example, uh, I have been pilloried not just by opponents of mine in my upcoming uh, March 17th primary, uh, but I've also been attacked by members of, of the news media for signing this amicus brief. And we just have to make very clear what all of us in the pro-life movement uh, agree upon and what we are about. We are about providing the best for women and for their babies. Um, are you disappointed there isn't more support within the party for your stance, your pro-life stance? Well, I'm, I'm very disappointed there's not more support in the Democratic Party. When 30 percent of Democratic voters across the country consider themselves to be pro-life, I think it's terrible for the Democratic Party, just in its own self-interest, to be pushing 30 percent of Democratic voters out of the party. That is not a winning formula for the party, if you're just looking at it strategically. Uh, but Obviously, uh, this issue is not just about politics. It should not be at all about politics. It should be about what's best for women and their babies. And what are you expecting the crowds to be like this weekend at the rally? Well, the, the crowd has gotten bigger and bigger every year that I've spoken there in, in Chicago, so I'm really looking forward to it. Uh, the weather doesn't look great, unfortunately, but uh, I know that uh, all of us in the pro-life movement uh, will will brave any weather to be out there to support life. Wonderful. Thank you so much for being with us again. Representative Dan Lipinski, Democrat from Illinois, thank you. Thank you. Pope Francis warns against increasing tensions between Iran and the U.S., saying that it is setting the stage for a broader conflict in the Mideast while jeopardizing efforts to rebuild Iraq. E che rischiano anzitutto di mettere a dura prova il lento processo di ricostruzione dell'Iraq. 
While speaking to ambassadors to the Holy See, the Holy Father urged all of the interested parties to, quote, avoid an escalation of the conflict and keep alive the flame of dialogue and self-restrain in full respect of international law. Pope Francis made clear the American strike and Iran's response to it was worrisome in the volatile region. Janusz Katensky, Ambassador of Poland to the Holy See, joins us now from Rome. Ambassador, thank you so much for joining us today. It's my pleasure. Thank you, Tracy. Uh, Pope Francis emphasized his desire for peace and dialogue in the new year. What's your reaction to the Pope's overall message to diplomats today, and what stood out to you? I would say that what His Holiness said today is extremely important. The main word was hope. Uh, it's, it was really obvious that uh, Pope Francis is very concerned about so many wars, about so many conflicts all over the world, uh, not only in the Middle East, but wherever you look, in Africa, in Asia, in Europe. There are wars, internal conflicts, so many refugees, so many people who are running away from their homes. And uh, the question is what to do. I don't think that it is too idealistic if we are counting on the Christian, on the Catholic hope. We must have a hope without the hope that we can resolve all the problems. Well, if not all, maybe some of them without using the force, that's a good news. But uh, if we are looking now at the map of the world, we are not sitting on one volcano, but we are sitting on many volcanoes which can explode every minute, uh, as we have learned just in a couple of days. Yeah, and you mentioned uh, the wars and the violence, which, of course, was another key topic in the Holy Father's speech. Do you think it's possible for politicians to have a dialogue when there are lives on the line? Mm, well, I think it is very, very difficult, but, but possible. Um, we can't pretend that uh, we are all together, a great family of friends. Uh, uh, no. It's, it's not like that. Uh, that will be a first. But uh, we are all people. I, even if we differ very much, like uh, Sunni, Shia, Catholics, Protestants, Orthodox, Yazidi, Hindu, mm, we must find a common solution to resolve all those problems who are dividing us. Mm, Otherwise, what will happen? Not in this speech, but um, a couple of months ago, Pope Francis said about the crawling Third World War. We must do everything to avoid the Third World War. I think also that the very important words of His Holiness were when he was talking about the conflict in the southern, in Latin America. Well, he's from Argentina, so he knows perfectly well what's going on. His words about the horrible situation in Venezuela, about the people suffering in Venezuela and so many states were very moving because those problems, those uh, social problems are being inspired by the extremists from far left or far right. And we mustn't be moved by those evil forces. So we must uh, work together for the goodness of people because we are the sons of God, yeah. one God, Jesus Christ. Janusz Katinski, Ambassador of Poland to the Holy See, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Tracy. Thank you so much. God bless you. U.S. officials say it is highly likely that Iran is responsible for the Ukrainian jetliner crash Tuesday night that killed all 176 people on board. Tehran says the plane was found by a mechanical issue. The White House dismisses those claims but adds the plane may have been hit by mistake. The crash came just hours after Iran launched a missile strike against Iraqi military bases housing U.S. troops. The new director of China's liaison office in Hong Kong met for the first time with the city's chief executive. The discussions took place at the former British Territory's government house. Chief Executive Carrie Lam says that she looks forward to working with Beijing's representatives to fully implement basic law. Hong Kong has been the site of months of pro-democracy protests. 
Prince Harry and Meghan Markle's announcement to step down as senior members of the royal family is stirring up some criticism. The couple announced plans on social media to become financially independent from the royal family and split time between the UK and North America. However, some feel the move is a snub to the Queen who didn't know. The Duke and Duchess of Sussex is also now being compared to King Edward VIII and his wife Wallace Simpson, a divorced American for whom he abdicated the throne in 1936. Coming up, why Christians in the Middle East are fearful of the tension between the United States and Iran. As we reported earlier, tensions remain high between the United States and Iran, and Christians in northern Iraq are becoming increasingly concerned. In a statement yesterday, Archbishop Bashar Warda of Erbil, Iraq, said the Christian communities there, quote, need the certainty, reassurance, hope, and the belief that Iraq can be a peaceful country to live and rather than being victims of endless collateral damage. Joining us now via Skype is Father Benedict Keeley, founder of Nazarene.org, which focuses on persecuted Christians throughout the world, but particularly in the Middle East. Father, welcome to the show today. Thank you for having me, Tracy. Father, we know that you're in touch with Christians in Iraq. Can you update us on their situation and also how close they were to those areas that were bombed by Iran earlier this week? Well, some of them were very close because one of the missiles landed in the uh, Christian quarter of Ankawa near the U.S. consulate, I believe, but also landed at the international airport because the U.S. base is there. But they're more really worried about what's going to happen after this now because they're surrounded, so many of them, by the Shia militias who are controlled by Iran. Do you know, is there anything the Trump administration is doing to help the Christians there? Well, I'm very supportive of the Trump administration compared to the last administration in terms of their attitude towards Christians. But I have to say at the moment, no, they feel very, very... Uh, unprotected. I spoke to a priest yesterday, a friend of mine, and he said, we're in, we're in great danger. He said, no one is protecting us. They have 24 Christian soldiers guarding them, but they are surrounded by Shia militia and now a rising ISIS. It's a myth that ISIS has been defeated. ISIS is rising again, and it's very, very scary for these Christians who were driven out in their thousands just five years ago. It was, sounds really scary indeed. Well, how do you think this week's events will affect the Christians who left the region? Because, as you mentioned, ISIS and we're considering on returning. I fear, Tracy, that they will not return. I think, why would they return? Would you go back when uh, there's a likelihood that you'll be driven out again, maybe murdered, your women uh, kidnapped and raped? So this, this, unfortunately, unless something radical happens very soon to protect the Christians, this might be the final nail in the coffin for the Christians, certainly of Iraq, certainly of the Nineveh Plain, where they've been for 2,000 years, let's remember. Father, can you tell us a little bit, for those that might not know, can you tell us a little bit more about the history of Christians in that region? Well, it's funny, Tracy, sometimes when I speak in the U.S. and in England, people say, well, we never knew that uh, there were Christians in the Middle East, as though we brought them Christianity. Of course, remember St. Paul was on his way to Damascus, to an already existing Christian community, to persecute them. Christians have been in Iraq and Syria from the beginning, 2,000 years ago. We didn't bring them Christianity, they brought us Christianity. And so we must, if we're believers in Jesus Christ, if we say we're Christians, we must care for our brothers and sisters. Uh, this is the cradle of Christianity. This is where it all began. And they're beautiful people. They're just like us, families and but there's that incredible heritage. This is the Holy Land. It's not just Israel, Palestine. It's Egypt, it's Iraq, it's Syria. The Lord walked, his feet touched these sacred ground, this sacred ground. And so we must, Christians, have a real concern. And I have to say, Tracy, it's a horrible thing to say, but a lot of the Christians in the Middle East tell me they feel that we in the West don't really care about them. And that's very heartbreaking. Well, Father, what can we as Christians over here do for our fellow Christians over there? Well, first and foremost, we pray for them. That's not an easy option. Sometimes we say, oh, well, we can just pray for them. We must pray for them. Why are we not praying for them continually? It's not good enough to just have a few prayers at Mass. Why aren't we calling? Why aren't the bishops calling very strongly, very aggressively 
in the same way they speak about climate change, perhaps, or even the border in the US, why are they not speaking? So prayer and then charity, obviously, and speaking to legislators. Why are the legislators not working hard to protect the Christians in the, in the Middle East? Father Benedict Keeley, founder of Nazarene.org, thanks so much for joining us today, and thank you for your insight. Bless you, Tracy. Up next, Pope Francis tells us how Christians can bring peace to the world. Le guerre, che nel mondo non ci siano le guerre. Pope Francis says true Christians do not seek conflict anywhere. At his daily mass at the Vatican, the Holy Father says peace begins in our hearts. And there is a sure way for the faithful to remain close to the Lord in times of trouble by showing our love for others in simple and little ways. Well, if your parents are small children, then chances are you've probably experienced some challenges while trying to go to mass as a family. One mom in Michigan knows all too well about those difficulties, so she decided to do something about it. Teresa Poby Mensa, co-creator of My Catholic Kids, joins us now from Skype from Erie, Michigan. Teresa, thanks so much for speaking with us today. Yes, thank you so much. Well, you created the children's missalette with your husband, Charles. What led you to come up with that idea? So God blessed us with three beautiful, but very rambunctious boys. And so wherever we go to mass, everyone knows we're there. And the thing that I noticed is while they were had, you know, an over exuberance, the parts of the mass that they knew, you could hear them. During the Our Father, they were the loudest participants. And so we thought, what if we could channel that enthusiasm and teach them all the different parts of mass so that they could bring that joy to the entire experience. What a great idea. So what age is the missalette geared towards and how does it keep the kids interested? Okay, so the missalette starts at like age five and it's something simple that they can carry along with them. And the idea is it's actually like an advent calendar that they can kind of open little windows as they go through the mass and it breaks down each of the different parts of mass. And so there's 10 little windows that as they go through the mass and they see the opening sign of the cross or the first reading, they get to open it and then it reveals a picture at the end that has a story on it. And so it keeps them eyes focused on the altar, on the priest, and it keeps them following along with mass. That's incredible. That's incredible. So how has this changed your experience at mass for your family? So last week at mass, our two-year-old, who's two, was participating at the prayer of the faithful. And he was with his little voice, Lord, hear our prayer. <laughs> and my heart just melted because um, with the missalette, there is a video that they watch beforehand um, called diving into or mass muscles to build up their spiritual muscles. And so as we were watching the video on the way to mass, uh, one of the things was encouraging the kids that at the prayer of the faithful, we want to hear your voices saying, Lord, hear our prayer. And so it's like we had just listened to that as a family. We had the missalette. So then him at two years old was watching, listening to his brothers, and he was participating too. And so, I mean, it was not, the whole mass was not perfect, but little by little, it's like we're teaching them the parts of the mass. They're falling in love with it, and they're participating. That's great. Have you heard from other families who have the missalette and how it's helped them? It's that part has been the most overwhelming. Um, one of the stories that like had me openly weeping was um, a father who's Catholic. Um, they have several children. Um, his wife is not Catholic. And so mass has kind of been a struggle of like, Protestant church can be a lot more fun. Um, and so for the kids, when they had to go to Catholic mass, it was not what they wanted. Um, but in having the children's missalette and having the videos, he said it not only helped his wife to understand it so that she could help the kids to follow along, but the kids were actually excited to go to mass now. Um, and that's the biggest thing that we hear from parents is that their kids complain, they didn't wanna go. And now it's something that they look forward to. They ask, when are we going to mass again so we can get a new missalette? Um, and so helping kids to, that they're excited that they're asking to go to mass, that's life changing. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you so much, Teresa Poby Mensa, co creator of My Catholic Kids. Thanks for joining us. Absolutely. And thank you for watching tonight. For the entire EWTN News Nightly team, I'm Tracy Sable. We'll be back tomorrow with more news from a Catholic perspective. Good night and God bless.